Prime Time Local News, serving the Lakeland and Midwest regions. The Lloydminster Chamber hosted the Economic Partnership Summit at the Lloyd X with the goal of evaluating Indigenous and non-Indigenous businesses. I had the chance to find out more about this annual event. The day-long event kicked off with a pipe ceremony, followed by a keynote speaker, Ashley Collingbull, an international motivational speaker who spoke on her own story, as well as the importance of having this summit. It's so important to highlight indigenous talent, entrepreneurs, people that are really coming up because they need that access, they need the opportunity to have these spaces where they can shine, show people what they can truly offer to the world because we have so much to offer. We can excel in so many different spaces, we really just need that opportunity. The summit is designed to strengthen indigenous businesses partnerships as well as host educational sessions for those interested. Creating new relationships, new business relationships. So coming together and meeting people. I was just chatting with a business that um, you know, was able to get new clients um, and uh, start some new work. Um, so I think that partnerships is the biggest thing, but it's also about education and, and uh, listening to amazing speakers like Ashley Collingbull today. And, uh, and so just that um, multiple of uh, kind of a cultural day, education, professional development and networking. Throughout the summit, New ideas are brought to the table, but the rich history of the Indigenous people does not fade. I think bringing back to life old ideas, old and old concepts, and uh, trying to awaken uh, that new and next generation of young entrepreneurs to, and making them believe and realize that, wait a minute, this is an old idea. Let's get back to this notion of Pimachisuin. In Cree, Pimachisuin means making your own living, your own livelihood, and we got to get back to that. This year was the 11th installment of the Economic Summit, and barring a global pandemic, should appear in Lloydminster next year for the 12th Summit. Callan Dunlop, Primetime, Local News. The third National Day for Truth and Reconciliation is taking place this year. In this week's Beyond the Classroom, Jace Mackey shows us how LCSD students started their week off of indig Indigenous-centered learning. Elementary students from the Lloydminster Catholic School Division are witnessing a TP rising. This partnership through Lakeland College has been going on for a number of years. It stays up here for a while and, until it gets a little windy and a little cold and then sometimes they put Christmas lights on it. But it's a nice symbol for the students to see and nice, um, nice for them to say they were part of it. TNR Day will be marked in LCSD schools on Friday and this activity is the starting point of the students' learning. They are getting to see that culture and they're getting to see it come to life actually and learning about it in the classroom and watching videos and stuff like that is nice but being able to actually see it come to life is just one more way that students can kind of understand the culture. And anything we can teach them is just another step forward in reconciliation. Indigenous programming staff educated the students on the history of the TP, sharing their lived experience. A lot of times when as teachers it's kind of difficult to be able to put that first-hand knowledge in because I am not Indigenous. So having those people who are Indigenous and kind of are able to share their culture and how they grew up and the things that they use in their home life and their everyday life, it's, it's really, it's amazing. Heading outside of the classroom for this activity made it special for the kids. Me and my friend, uh, we were like excited to sit together and like learn about the stuff because we don't get to be outside much. I learned a bit about indigenous peoples in grade three, mm -hmm. but I don't, I've never been to one of these. And that's it for this week, Beyond the Classroom. Experience learning in action at the Lakeland College Open House on October 20th and 21st at our Lloydminster and Vermilion campuses. Now we've had some nice fall days in terms of weather, but will this nice weather continue, Jace? It's going to continue for at least a day, and yes, we've had some beautiful fall uh, conditions here um, after it being a little cold, I think, last week, um, but this weekend it is going to cool down a little bit. But let's take a look here at our almanac to start off uh, our weather forecast today. 
And uh, some good news is that it was warmer today than it is for our seasonal average, which it's been all week. So uh, we're keeping that trend going, which is obviously nice when uh, we can kind of keep those warm conditions coming in because a lot of times when it hits fall, it just gets cold so quickly and uh, our winters last so long. So it's nice to be able to see uh, some warmer than usual conditions. Uh, sunset and sunrise are around uh, 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. And those are going to keep getting shorter minute by minute as we go over the next couple of months. As uh, we sit here at the Lloydminster Airport at 20 degrees, uh, pretty consistent to where we were yesterday. A little colder, but still uh, fairly nice, and the wind's coming in at 15 kilometers an hour. North Battleford is uh, up next, and 21 degrees is the current temperature in North Battleford. That's quite a bit colder than it was yesterday. Yesterday we had like August, July temperatures uh, close to 30 degrees. Right now sitting at uh, sunny 21, so uh, not too bad for this time of the year, but definitely colder than uh, the past couple of days in North Battleford. Over now to Cold Lake, uh, 19 degrees and sunny. Pretty consistent with what we've been seeing from Cold Lake over the next little bit, but a nice day as well. A little less windy in Cold Lake than it is here in Lloyd Minster. Taking a look across the region, we can see uh, starting off on the Alberta side, uh, um, our warmest spot there is, uh, we have a couple spots tied for it, Vermilion, Marwain, and Provost all sitting at 21 degrees. Uh, they were ranging from between 22, uh, I think, and 18 degrees. As we come on the Saskatchewan side, we can see some of the temperatures there. Hottest spot is at 21 as well, and there's a couple of them, Green Lake, Meadow Lake, Maidstone, and North Battle for it all sitting at 21 so fairly consistent temperatures as we go across both sides of the border here in Alberta and as well in Saskatchewan taking a look at what we're expecting overnight tonight here in Lloydminster it'll be a cloudy evening chance we'll see some rain overnight tonight things will cool down to a seven degrees Celsius as we move over to North Battleford, things will cool down as well to 7 degrees. There's a chance you'll see some showers as well in North Battleford and those clouds will come in as well. Different story though in Cold Lake, 5 degrees, a little colder than it'll be here and in North Battleford. But the no chance that we'll be seeing rain in Cold Lake. So very, uh, very nice for that. I'm sure people in Cold Lake are happy about that. There will be some clouds coming in though as as the night uh, kind of rolls on. Uh, taking a look at the next three days here in the border city. A chance we'll see some rain in the morning tomorrow at the high of 19. And as I mentioned to Callan, heading into weekend, things cool off. So on that Friday, we'll have, we'll have a cloudy day with a high of 13. And goes a degree lower as we head into Saturday. A uh, sunny day, but it's uh, not going to be too warm with a high of 12. So this has been our first look at weather. Stay with us, though. I'll have more weather later on in the show. Coming up after the break, we'll take a look at today's business headlines. The Lakeland women's volleyball team is practicing up to try and repeat their national championship run from last year. And our Thomas Wildman has more on the elite team. All of the starters from last year's championship team are back on the court for the wrestlers once again, and the girls couldn't be happier for volleyball season beginning. It's so exciting, and we didn't lose anyone, so we're out here, and we're, we came back basically as soon as we ended last year. We were all counting down the days and working hard all summer, and we're back now, and honestly, it's great to see everybody's face back in the gym. Also returning is the CCAA Women's Volleyball Coach of the Year, Austin Dyer, and he says that not only keeping the skill from last year's team is huge, but also the strong team bond. You've had girls that you've played with for the majority of your post-secondary career. Um, it, it, it's a lot of fun for them because they, they get to grow, learn, and build together. Um, and obviously volleyball is a team sport, and so uh, it, it takes all of them for us to have success. And, uh, you know, if a, if a large group of them continue to return, uh, they get to keep getting better. Um, and they get to do that together, and they get to share that experience with each other, um, which, uh, you know, for, for us, I think, is a really big part of the culture that we have here. The girls will have to continue getting better as while favorites to do well again this year, the hard work they put in will be key to another championship. Uh, I think we're a very dedicated team. We, we also keep each other incredibly accountable. Uh, we do everything for each other. There's no one person and the rest of us. It's, it's always together. And I think that's what really holds us together and makes us so successful. And yes, there's the whole, there's people snipping at our heels, but I think that what we've put into this program and 
the hard work that's been happening the last couple of years, that's, that's where it just sends us over the edge and makes us so much better. The wrestlers will have their final few preseason games when they head to Saskatoon and take on the University of Saskatchewan Huskies. Thomas Wildman, Primetime, Local News. For an updated look on weather, you came to the right place. Here is Jace Mackey with more weather. Yes, you did. You're at the right place. Thank you so much, Callan, and welcome to my weather corner. As we uh, take a look at our satellite and radar map, I'm actually going to get on this side here. You can see some of uh, the um, precipitation that we could be seeing coming through our region over the next 24 hours. Uh, we could be hitting around, uh, around here in the evening tonight, and it'll be heading through uh, into Saskatchewan. But let's take a look at... Uh, what your day will look like here in Lloydminster, especially for those kiddos getting ready to go to school once again. Uh, cold morning, 7 degrees. Uh, sun will be out though and things will warm up to around uh, 11 for your first recess. Uh, sun will be out around that time as well. Around lunchtime there's a chance we'll see some rain. Some chance we'll see some rain tonight as well. 15 degrees though for uh, the temperature around lunchtime. And then look at that, 18 degrees by the time we head out, uh, or you head out for school on the end of the day, and uh, that'll be around our daytime high for the day on Thursday. Taking a look at the day tomorrow in North Battleford, chance we'll see some rain in the afternoon as well. Things will uh, be cooling off from what uh, North Battleford uh, temperatures have been looking like uh, over the past week. Uh, pretty consistent with today though, 19 degrees, uh, partly cloudy, partly sunny day. Moving over to Cold Lake now, 18 degrees is the high tomorrow in Cold Lake. Chance we'll see, uh, not a chance we'll see some rain, but we'll have a little bit of clouds coming through, but a mostly sunny day in Cold Lake. Taking a look at uh, what you can expect overnight tonight at some other spots across our region. Chance there'll be some rain in uh, Meadow Lake as well as Paradise Hill, 6 degrees uh, in both those spots. 6 degrees as well overnight tonight in Provost. Cold night in Bonneville sitting at a high of 4 and uh, the warmest on this board is Alacross at 9 overnight tonight, but uh, some clouds will start rolling in. Continuing our uh, overnight look across our region, 5 degrees in Miranam, Pierceland, as well as Wainwright. Chance we'll see some rain in Unity as well as Wainwright, uh, 7 degrees overnight tonight in Unity. As we take a shift over to what the day is going to look like tomorrow across our region, chance we'll see some rain again in Meadow Lake as well as Paradise Hill. Those afternoon, the showers will be in the afternoon uh, and most likely in Meadow Lake and in the morning in Paradise Hill. 18 degrees in both Meadow Lake, Bonneville and Paradise Hill as well as Alacross. 19 degrees in Provo. Sunny days for most of those, um, those areas, Bonneville, Provost and Alacross. Continuing our look over the next um, the next days across our region, chance we'll see some rain in Miriam with a high of 18 degrees. That shower will take place in the afternoon. 18 degrees is also our high in Pierceland. 19 degrees uh, is the daytime high in Unity as well as Wainwright, and it'll be a part. Partly sunny, partly cloudy day in all those uh, other regions. In Wainwright, though, it will be a mostly cloudy day. Some sun will hopefully shine through for the day in Wainwright, but 19 degrees is still fairly warm. Taking a look now here at our next seven days in the border city. Chance we'll see some rain tomorrow and around uh, the afternoon hour here in Lloydminster. 19 degrees is your high. So cloudy day tomorrow and those clouds will continue uh, to stay on uh, here on Friday and it'll be a lot colder. 13 degrees is your high on Friday. Heading into weekend we have a cold Saturday, a mostly cloudy day, a high of 12, 15 degrees and periods of sun on Sunday and then things warm up as we head into next week. Well, a little bit at least. 17 degrees is the high on both Monday and Tuesday. A cloudy day on Tuesday leads into a showery day on Wednesday with a chance we'll have some afternoon showers. And finally, I want to leave you with a photo we received from Natasha. She took this along Highway 17. I thought it looked beautiful. Almost looks like it could be coming out of the Lion King or something like that. This has been your extended look at weather. Callan Dunlop will be back after the break for more news.
October 1st is National Seniors Day, and that leads into Seniors Week in Saskatchewan. And there's a lot planned next week here in Lloydminster for seniors. I'm joined today by Patrick Lancaster from FCSS here in Lloydminster and Don Bowie, who is the manager of the Lloydminster Museum and Archive, to go over some of these events that are open to uh, residents in the city over the age of 55 years old. So Patrick, I'll start with you. There's a lunch and learn event that's going to be taking place on October 5th. That's Thursday. Uh, talk to me a little bit about what's going to be taking place for that event. Thanks, Jason. As, as you said, we are excited uh, to, to celebrate uh, not only uh, National Seniors Day, but it is also uh, Seniors Week in Saskatchewan. So National Seniors Day, October 1st, Seniors Week in Saskatchewan, October 1st through 7th. And, and as a result, uh, the City of Lloydminster uh, has some different things going on. Uh, our team with Social Programs and Services is taking care of the Lunch and Learn. It's a, an event that we've run for several years now uh, over at the Legacy Centre. And uh, it's an opportunity for seniors to, to come together, enjoy some, uh, some, some companionship, some uh, good meal. And, uh, and we have a speaker this year, uh, Neil Harris. And Neil Harris is going to talk to seniors about the different stages of retirement. So we've got something uh, really being offered for folks that are uh, maybe coming up on retirement or have just retired uh, and, and even something uh, for folks that have been retired for a while now. It sounds like it's going to be a very interesting discussion. And I know that uh, retirement is a big transition for seniors. And there's an emphasis in this discussion on doing this transition with confidence. Exactly. It, it, it's something that uh, sometimes folks aren't always prepared for, uh, and, it, and it is a big shift in lifestyle. And uh, it's something that uh, we want to make sure that uh, our, our seniors here are prepared for it, uh, or those who that have already transitioned into retirement. Maybe they're they're looking for some tips and uh, and some strategies on how uh, they can better manage that. And again, this is a great opportunity to both uh, get some information from from Neil uh, and from from each other, because uh, we're going to have a lot of different seniors present uh, and a lot of folks uh, talking and chatting and, and learning from each other as well. Now, I want to shift over to Don now and talk about two events that are taking place ahead of the Lunch and Learn, and they both have to do with history and giving seniors a chance to kind of walk through the past of Lloyd Minster. Uh, one's taking place on Tuesday, the other is taking place on Wednesday, and we'll start with the one that's taking place first on Tuesday. It's an artifact warehouse tour. Uh, tell me more about what uh, seniors can expect from this event. Well, we're really excited to be able to open up our uh, normally not public facing uh, artifact warehouse. And that's where we store the, the artifacts with significant uh, historical uh, significance to Lloyd Minster and area. So we are offering seniors a free guided tour of that warehouse to kind of give them a behind the scenes showcase of uh, where the artifacts are, you know, and that step back in history. Can you share a little bit about what people may be able to see what artifacts will be on display for this tour? Absolutely. So they'll see classic cars, um, everything from the iron lung, um, uh, really interesting sports memorabilia. I know we have uh, cricket bats that date from the founding of Lloyd Minster, actually, oh. and, uh, you know, everything in between, uh, industry, uh, oil elements, you know, all kinds of stuff we offer. And as I mentioned, this isn't the only event that's taking place having to do with history and the museum, because there's tours of the museum taking place on Wednesday. Tell me a little more about that. Yeah, we're offering free guided tours for seniors through the, the museum. So that's going to be a nice time where we can offer, you know, not only admission uh, guided tours, as well as kind of snacks and, and luncheon provided by uh, Patrick and his department. So we're very happy to partner with them and, and, you know, have some excellent community offerings for our seniors. And both of those are events run from 1.30 until 2.30 on Tuesday and Wednesday. Uh, Patrick, talk to me about transportation options for seniors who may have a difficult time getting around. Yes, for, for seniors who are experiencing financial barriers to transportation, uh, they can reach out to our team, 780-875-6184, uh, uh, extension 2919, and they can talk to us and we'll help uh, to uh, to cover the costs of wh whether they need a, a taxi or uh, a ride with Border City Connects. Because again, we don't want anyone to, to not be able to attend because transportation was 
or the barrier. So uh, for for uh, for either the uh, warehouse tour, uh, the museum tour, or the lunch and learn, they can contact our team to coordinate that piece. Uh, for the actual attendance of those different events, uh, they can call, contact our team again at that two nine one nine to sign up, or sorry, RSVP for the lunch and learn. And uh, Don, what's the the number for the the museum there for folks who want to RSVP? So folks who want to RSVP at the museum, they can call here uh, 780-874-3720. Perfect. Well, I know that's a lot of information to get out there for people, but it's valuable and hopefully uh, everyone is able to take all of that in. Um, Patrick, too, you mentioned that uh, this isn't the first time that an event like this has been hosted uh, for seniors in the community. Why is it important that FCSS uh, works with partners to give uh, seniors opportunities to learn and develop and uh, feel appreciated. Uh, it, it is so important. Uh, our, our seniors are, are the folks that, that built our community. Uh, they're the folks, uh, they make up a, a tremendously uh, fast growing part of our community. Our senior population is really rising. Uh, and it's, uh, and, and, and well, eventually we all, all get there, we all become seniors. So we really need to recognize our seniors, take care of our seniors, and uh, we're very grateful uh, to be working with the Lloydminster Learning Council Association on this project. They're a key partner, and we wouldn't be able to have this event without, uh, without their support and their efforts. All right. Well, thank you both for taking some time to talk with me today and share everything that's going to be going on next week for Seniors Week in Saskatchewan. Sounds like it's going to be a lot of fun, and hopefully a lot of seniors here in Lloydminster can turn out. Furniture set and design supplied by Furniture Gallery, downtown Lloydminster. Dobson this week. Stephanie is a lawyer and mediator at Henka Divorce Law and Mediation here in Lloydminster. Continuing our series, actually wrapping up our series this month on the negotiation process on separation and divorce. So Stephanie, thanks for joining me today. Thanks again for having me, Stacey. All right. Well, we are going to get into the process here talking about collaborative divorce. So can you explain, first of all, what that is? Yes. So collaborative divorce is a process that's near and dear to my heart. I learned about it right very soon after I started practicing, actually, and it really works um, well for families. And so that's what I've been pursuing ever since. So collaborative divorce, um, you may, our viewers may remember last week, we talked a little bit about mediation. So both mediation and collaborative divorce, their similarity is that it's a process that focuses on finding resolution to post-separation issues in a way that works for both parties. So something that's mutually acceptable. But in collaborative divorce, it's a negotiation process where both spouses, so you and your former spouse will hire a specially trained collaborative lawyer who will assist you to resolve your divorce issues cooperatively. So that um, special training is a training in addition to law school. So it's a regular lawyer with some additional training. And the, the goal is for you and your former spouse to work together as allies rather than adversaries. So to help to find solutions that work for the whole family. And we're doing it with a commitment with, to uh, not using the court for a resolution. So how do people know, Stephanie, if collaborative divorce is the way to go for them? Well, our viewers may remember last week, I gave a little bit of a laundry list of mediation. So the similar points to mediation um, in collaborative divorce, you want to avoid having the court decide your future. Your children's needs are your priority above and above your own needs, which most parents can attest to. Uh, you want to focus on the future, not on the past. Reducing the conflict between you and your spouse is important and some kind of an efficient resolution, both cost effective and um, time effective resolution. The differences here with mediation is um, that we want to use lawyers as part of the whole process to help you really to understand your rights and obligations and to, um, I call it a little bit of hand holding to make sure that you're um, feeling supported as you go through the process and to make sure that your lawyer is, is uh, right by your side. 
So what professionals would be involved in this process? Well, of course, the foundation, and we've been talking here about lawyer involvement, so the foundation of every collaborative divorce process is two spouses and two lawyers. So your lawyer will always be on your team, but we may be able to add in additional team members based on the family's needs. Now, that might sound expensive, but in fact, um, if... Um, in, um, when we add team members, we don't always add team members in a way that there's two lawyers, two spouses, plus additional people. Sometimes um, spouses will work separately with other professionals to sort of um, piecemeal off certain sections of their, you know, their separation. So for example, there's financial professionals. You may work with them to work on the financial part of your divorce. There's um, uh, and then um, sometimes the uh, mental health professionals, the coaches can help you to develop a parenting plan that's in a child uh, development specialized way. There's child specialists. Sometimes even um, we have special appraisers and business valuators for certain assets um, um, that can be helpful. But the focus for all of those team members is that they're neutral. So they're hired by both spouses to help to, to bring one perspective. So for example, if a business valuation, you would have one business valuator to work with both spouses to bring that neutral business valuation instead of each spouse having to hire their own business valuator. It sounds like a lot, Stephanie, when you go through it. So uh, if people are looking to get started with this, wh what's the first step? So the first step is in our in our case, the first step is always a call to our office and we'll help you to figure out whether collaborative divorce or mediation or any other kind of process, even court. Sometimes court is the best option for some families. And so our goal is to help you to find the appropriate dispute resolution process, not just an out of court process, because that's what we offer. So um, if you if we've decided that, yes, we're going to go down the path of out of court divorce, then an initial consultation is always going to be the first step and we can take it from there. All right, Stephanie. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate speaking with you. I learned something new every week as well. So uh, <laughs> we'll be back next week uh, with another topic and another theme for the month of October. Thanks again for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me again, Stacey. We're just about to wrap up the show today, not mm -hmm. before we talk about some Canadian Dis Disney Plus users could soon find themselves locked out as the platform attempts to crack down on password sharing. Disney Plus 2 now? What is going on? The move comes after Netflix announced a similar crackdown earlier this year that was met with quick backlash from subscribers myself included. <laughs> According to Disney, the update will begin November 1st. Users are told to switch to a different plan before the new policy comes into effect. I don't have you been impacted by the Netflix uh password? Yeah, you have yeah, been, hey? I'm currently using my mom's, so don't tell and, anyone. And you're able to still or have you currently had to? am, but yeah. uh I mean they've talked about it so much I, I'm I fear I can't forever you the know? thing and I don't know about Disney Plus how it works but I know with Netflix you can pay to have more like screens oh, yeah. watching oh, at the same course, time of course you gotta pay for that you oh gotta pay God. for I don't know but you still can't share your password too so it's like if I'm paying more why can't I share it why like that should just be you should be able to if it's your choice it's your yeah. it's your password you know you can do whatever you want that's kind of what I think at least that's what I think yeah we'll see and that's all the time we have for you on primetime local news Thank you so much for watching. Have a great night.